good evening everyone uh, it is my immense pleasure to be here uh, today and to have uh, to be leading this panel discussion and on pulmonary tuberculosis new in interventions in an age old disease uh, at the outset itself i must uh, thank uh, cci for especially dr krishna for uh, always being the backbone behind uh, all these leading academics dr vijay kumar who has been the cci webinar, webinar coordinator for many many months and is doing a wonderful job making sure every thursday we have these meetings uh, of course uh, dr narendra dr ravi dosi for being the current um, cci office bearers and a few names who are behind the scene dr atri uh, dr kirat and dr shivani who are behind the scene warriors who are taking care of all the technical stuff and coordination and we have three wonderful panelists today to have this um, uh, discussion uh dr samir arbat who is an interventional uh, pulmonologist from uh one healthcare nagpur and he has been as you all must be knowing he has conducted many many cmes and meetings then we have dr mohan venkatesh kule who is a consultant thoracic and thoracoscopic surgeon from institute of chest surgery and chest onco surgery medanta medicity gurgaon and last but definitely not the least dr nagarjuna matru who is a consultant clinical and interventional pulmonologist from yashoda hospitals somaji goda hyderabad and uh, i welcome all these three panelists and we are going to have a session after my talk so initially we are going to have a talk followed by a question and answer discussion we can also take discussions in the chat box uh, questions in the chat box so please post the questions in the chat box and we can uh, take them up uh, as relevant so we now start with my uh, talk first good evening everyone it is my immense pleasure to be here uh, this evening uh, on this uh, extremely important uh, discussion on pulmonary tuberculosis new interventions in an age old disease it is something that is very close to my heart and something that we don't talk about as often so uh, i must thank cci for giving this opportunity to moderate the session and we have some extremely um, good panelists uh, for the session however before that i'm going to start with a small uh, introductory talk on interventions in tuberculosis so of course we all know about endobronchial ultrasound as a diagnostic modality I want to share with you some information so the important thing here is that you can sample lymph nodes which are very small in size even 5 mm yield is much better than the conventional tbna and much better samples for pathologists and that's where the entire difference lies also in tuberculosis the microbiological evidence is also better with uh, either samples rather than conventional tbna samples so of course in tb for extra pulmonary mediastinal tuberculosis I want to show you some cases where uh, it was important that we did an EBUS. So this is a young girl uh, in her mid thirties who came to us with um, this kind of a scan. This and uh, she had already been initiated on anti-TB treatment uh, two months ago because she had not wanted to uh, undergo a diagnostic procedure. She had no parenchymal or no other extra uh, pulmonary sites of infection however on a repeat scan her uh, ct showed an increase in these mediastinal lymph nodes you can see there are some areas of necrosis in the subcranial area there are lymph nodes in the uh, bilateral hilar region as well and therefore then she was referred for an eeg sample and what we found when we aspirated is we found this frank pus and what we got on uh, both expert and culture was mdr tb and she was then initiated an appropriate treatment this is another young girl a 14 year old girl who had this um, station 4l lymph node that is uh, left uh, paratracheal lymph node and again you can see some areas of necrosis within and this uh, patient had no other uh, again no other site of any other lymph node involvement and she was referred for an uh, ebus and for station 4l is not as easily sampled with the uh, conventional tbna we decided to go ahead with the ebus and this is what we found we got uh, inh mono resistance and she was treated appropriately with 6 months of um, he z and levofloxacin 
So this is how EBUS will help us. We will have some more discussion on this in the panel. Medical thoracoscopy, another important diagnostic tool and sometimes for therapeutic indications as well. Surgical aspects, again, we will discuss in the panel. Now, very often patients who are suspected to have tuberculosis will come with hemoptysis with very non-specific findings on the X-ray. You can just see a few infiltrative shadows in the uh, right lower zone. Even the CT may show just few nodular infiltrates and scars in the middle lobe. And when you do a, put in a scope, okay, this is what you will find. So in hemoptysis, you scope P1 for diagnosis and second for therapeutic. In this patient, as you can see, we are seeing a localized bleed coming only from the right middle lobe. And this was very easily controlled with just installation of wholesale line. There was no bleeding from any other area. And this patient's lavage also showed a, a gene expert positive rifampicin sensitive. Sometimes you may get patients like this. You can have a patient who is having obvious excessive bleeding, which is coming localized again, but from the left uh, entire bronchial tree. And these patients will require therapeutic interventions, which we will discuss in the panel. This is a young fellow who came with a large bout of hemoptysis and who was already initiated on AKT two months ago based on these uh, X-ray findings of a cavity in the right upper lobe. And he came and he had a massive bout, had shock, had to be ventilated. You can see there's endotracheal tube. This is what the CT was showing. There is a right upper lobe cavity. There are some there's a middle lobe cavity as well, and there are some infiltrative shadows in the lower lobe, which could be aspirated blood. This patient was referred to us for um, a diagnosis and for therapeutic intervention because the patient was on ventilator and on uh, noradrenaline support. And we went in, this is what we saw, we went in through the endotracheal tube. You can see the endotracheal tube over here. And you saw this large clot, organized clot, which was coming out through the right main bronchus, but actually the source was in the right upper lobe bronchus. And this we could easily remove with a dormia basket while the patient was on ventilator. This, you can see this large, well-organized clot that was removed and subsequently the airways were clear. The lower bronchial tree was also clear. However, it's not always so easy. So this is a patient who you can see there is a large clot mixed with mucus in the left main bronchus. What I'm showing you is that conventional methods may not be possible to easily remove the clot end mask. Also, this clot is not very well organized. So obviously the forceps is not working to remove the clot in its entirety. And eventually, what we did manage to remove is piecemeal clots, which can be very tiring and cumbersome. You can see this patient has a tracheostomy. However, we were successful in this patient at least, and we managed to open up the left collapse lung to a large extent. In other patients, when you have this very loosely formed clot, you will need other methods where you will be able to remove the entire clot and it will look like this. Your what was used is a cryo. Debulking. Sometimes you can have tracheal granulations due to tuberculosis, which is seen over here. And what you can use is either laser or you can use cautery. Cautery, what is called as a poor man's laser, as you can see, has been effective in uh, removing the granulations and helping in debulking. So let's look at this case. This is a 30-year-old uh, female radiologist who presented with a 10-day history of dry cough, only one spike of fever 10 days ago, and right-sided chest pain only since 10 days. There are no comorbidities. This is what her x-ray looked like. If you can see that there is, this looks like this dense lesion over here in the right upper lobe. You're also seeing a prominent uh, minor fissure. There are no evidence of air bronchograms over here. And this is what the CT showed. This is a contrast enhanced CT. You're seeing there is this dense lesion in which is occupying the right upper lobe. There is a mediastinal infiltration also, a little bit of tracheal compression. And see what we went inside and saw was this. This looks like a mass, right? It's a mass which was, we thought it's a mass which is looked like partly obstructing the right main bronchus itself. It was originating from the right upper lobe bronchus. The secondary carina was uh, thickened lot of uh, granulation tissue there as well. And the first impression that we had when we looked at this lesion was, oh, it's 
maybe it's like a smooth listening thing maybe it's a carcinoid it's a young female short history no long history and on biopsy it was bleeding as well so we at the same sitting ladder up doing a partial debulking subsequently we were able to pass the scope through the uh, right upper lobe bronchus and there was a lot of secretions and stuff coming out which was also sent for washings and culture to our surprise so to our surprise this patient turned out not to be carcinoid not to be malignancy but actually it turned out to be granulomas and the gene expert was positive on the washings along with culture positive which was rifampicin insensitive and this was a presentation of a tumorous type of endobronchial tuberculosis presenting as a well defined mass lesion so balloon bronchoplasty this is something extremely close to my heart and something that i have been doing for many many years as you can see that there are many many indications for balloon bronchoplasty however in our country one of the most common ones the least i get a referral for is for post infectious stenosis especially in tuberculosis because this is very rampant in our country so in some cases this is um this is a lady which was referred uh, to me by another pulmonologist and you can see that there is this uh, this patient has already been on uh, anti tb drug she was sputum positive initially and after 4 months of treatment as you can see there is this persistent right upper lobe shadow you are seeing a little bit of air bronchogram but distally it is dense again on the scan this is confirmed that you are seeing uh, uh anterior segment um, uh is being seen however uh, they are bron you know however the apical segment is not being seen very well and the posterior segment is cut off over here so this patient was subsequently referred to me we did a scopy and you can see over here that the right upper lobe posterior segment is like a pinhole and the rest segments in fact are bronchiectetic upper lobe uh, apical segment is narrowing we did a serial dilatation of both the apical segment posterior segment quarter incision was taken and a dilatation was done however this is difficult to do and you can see that post procedure there was only partial expansion of the upper lobe the posterior segment over here still remains like there is some amount of collapse and narrowing you can see some air bronchogram is being seen over here distally but however it is not completely expanded so right upper lobe lesions especially the segmental lesions are difficult to intervene if they come at a later stage this is a young fellow again who had uh, already been treated with tuberculosis and had presented with this x-ray again under treatment with somebody else referred to be by another chest physician you can see that there is a uh, right sided hyperinflation there is herniation of the right lung there is mediastinal deviation when we put in the scope we found 3 mm narrowing of the left main bronchus the scope was not negotiable further in fact the pediatric scope was also not negotiable further and what we had to do was take incisions pottery incisions over here and at the 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock position followed by serial dilatations and what we removed distally was all this muck some amount of slough and this is the subsequent video this has been done on a follow up as you can see there are some granulations there distally there is still some slough that is there some secretions which we removed however the lower lobe and the upper lobe are both patent distally we applied mitomycin at these proximal lesions over here we cauterized these in lesions and applied mitomycin because uh, there is evidence to suggest that mitomycin application reduces the rate of recurrence in stenosis and as you can see subsequently the x-ray has completely expanded and this is very very fruitful so you can say that in some patients definitely you can get very dramatic results and this is most thrilling because these are young patients usually who have whom you are giving a good quality of life subsequently who have been, who have come to you with cough breathlessness and subsequently you are believing their symptoms this is one of my only elderly gentleman who came with bronchial narrowing he is a 76 year old male again referred to me by another chest physician you can see that there is complete left sided white out there is a complete collapse of the left side again mediastinal shift herniation of the right lung into the left 
CT scan is showing the same findings, of, is corroborating the same findings. However, the important thing here to see is that distally you are seeing a bronchus, even though the lung is completely collapsed, you can see that there is, this is the right main bronchus, you're seeing that the left side, there is some bronchus here, there is some bronchus. So this means that there is possibility for an intervention and you could potentially improve this patient's uh, airway condition and therefore the quality of life. Again, you are seeing that there is a slight pinhole thing distally, though proximally you are not seeing, it looks like it's completely cut off and see what we found when we put in the scope. So as expected, we found no opening whatsoever on the left side. As you can see, this is completely, completely blocked off. There is just some tethering over there. So what we did in this patient was we put in the forceps and we jabbed it to see if there is a soft area. And we just pierced it with a needle and put the guide wire to see if it was going through. Once the guide wire was going through, we took cautery incisions and did serial dilatations. You can see there is again a lot of slough over here, which we removed. Here you can see that the airway till almost three-fourth of the left main bronchus is very fibrotic. There's a lot of slough. So we had to go in slowly. We are going into the right side to see if that there is no spillover, if there is any spillover to clear it off. And you can see slowly we managed to create some patency. We're just using the forceps to break off these thin adhesions which are there. And this is his subsequent scopy which was done oh, some days later. These patients usually require a stepwise approach because you need to give them some time to heal. You can see that the previous scopy was looking very dirty. This time it's looking much better. And again, in this patient, you have a patent distal airway. You can see the only my lingular narrowing is there, but the rest of the upper lobe and the lower lobe are completely patent. And again, therefore, this will have a very good therapeutic outcome. So this is his x-ray pre-procedure. We have taken cautery incisions, dilated, subsequent, this is the size of the airway. And this is what his x-ray is. Here it is not completely expanded yet, but there is good amount of aeration in the upper zone and in the mid zone. This is a, a recent female, young female, treated with empirical AKT for fever, cough for a year. She got pregnant while she was on AKT and delivered. However, um, post-completion of treatment, she had this, again, left-sided whiteout with mediastinal shift, now progressive breathlessness and cough. This is her CT. If you can see that there is a mediastinal shift, some amount of hyperinflation. There are these fibro electric changes over here. Upper lobe is not being seen. The lower lobe is somewhat aerated with some areas of nodularity and fibroid electric changes. When we went in, we couldn't see the left main bronchus because there were some secretions over there. After clearing the secretions, you can see that it is almost like a pinhole stenosis. You're seeing all these stenotic bands over here where we took a cautery incision over here. Okay. And then subsequently, as we went lower down, there were again areas of similar stenosis and a couple of more cautery incisions were needed followed by dilatation. Here on the dilatation, you can see that the distal is patent. Once this was done, you could see a lot of thick purulent secretions and slough coming out. And this is what the patency was achieved. Here, this has been done just one month ago. And we managed to achieve a good patency where the adult scope could be passed in through till up to two thirds of the left main bronchus. However, distally, we could only pass the pediatric bronchoscope and the upper lobe was not very well visualized. Lower lobe was completely clear. Now she's awaiting a second session. This is her next procedure. So typically these procedures are done serially because sometimes they're long procedures. They're not as small and short as I've shown. Obviously these are edited videos and photographs and uh, you need to evaluate the therapeutic outcome before you decide to do something very dramatic because sometimes over uh, overzealous intervention can also be harmful. You do not want to create a, a bronchomediastinal fistula or a tear. So when to suspect? Okay, This is something that I 
really want to actually uh, talk about because I realize that very often we ourselves miss this. You know, sometimes when you have a patient who's having uh, dyspnea on walking and having noisy breathing, okay, which is sometimes sounding like a strider, but is not actually like a strider. Sometimes they say that they have wheezing when they are having exertion. And on auscultation, you will find monophonic bronchus. Especially when you have endobronchial tuberculosis. Okay, so we know that this has been uh, described by Chog at all that you have various endobronchial pictures. So, caseating type, which is what you're seeing in this, this is, has a predisposition for eventually developing fibrostenosis. You have the hyperemic edematous type where there is just bronchial wall edema. You could have the tumorous type, which is what we saw in our previous young radiologist. Then you could have a fibrostenotic type, which we will discuss. Sometimes you will get granularity. You may just have ulcers and sometimes you may have non-specific bronchitic. Now here you can see that there are these granular lesions, ulcerative lesions. There is some amount of um, hyperemic area. This is another young girl who was on AKT for, um, she had a brain lesion, which was causing uh, and significant symptoms and which required evacuation and that showed that she had MDRTB. Along with that, she had some pulmonary lesions because, but because we had a diagnosis, we did not do a scopy at that time. However, uh, there was some amount of slow resolution radiologically. So we went ahead and did a scopy after six months of the intensive phase. And we found these kind of lesions in the airway, which we biopsied and which, we, which showed granulomas. So please remember that there is a doubt of endobronchial tuberculosis or if you are seeing endobronchial tuberculosis, these patients need to be followed up because there is evidence that states, states that caseating type, when you have the edematous type, the tumorous type, okay, um, granular ulcerative type, especially out of all these, the fibrostenotic and the tumorous type are the ones that are very unpredictable. And we don't know how they're going to behave. Typically, what data says, there is a lot on this. Uh, you know, not really a lot, but there is some data on this, which says that when you have uh, patients who have uh, the tumorous fibrostenotic type or the caseating ulcerative type, these are the ones who have a propensity to develop stenosis later on and should be followed, on, followed up with the review bronchoscopy. Usually, at by two to three months, you have some idea of which way the lesions are going, whether they're going to heal or whether they're they causing stenosis over there. And the only one that behaves unpredictably is the tumorous type. And therefore, this needs to be followed up even more closely like our patient. So continuing when to suspect upper lobe disease because the airway is narrow. So if there is some amount of stenosis that is happening, it is very easily likely to get blocked. And usually because upper lobe forms a small part of the lung parenchyma, it very often doesn't give to rise to a lot of symptoms. So patients sometimes ignore it. So please, please remember, like our case that I showed you of right upper lobe disease, if there is a patient who's having this kind of a picture not resolving radiologically, though, Clinically, patients' fever and cough has decreased. Please remember that one must put in a scope or at least ask your first ask your radiologist to give you good pictures, which will tell you whether there is a narrowing happening, followed by putting in a scope and seeing if you can intervene. Do not wait for the treatment to finish for six months because that will be very, very late. So in any patient in whom you're having this kind of suspicion, please do a scopy at three months to assess whether the lesion is improving or whether there is a reason, uh, need to intervene. Early intervention is important. When you have large mass-like parenchymal lesions, like we saw in our young radiologist, again, these have a tendency to cause compression. Bulky lymph nodes, especially paratracheal lymph nodes, hyaluronic lymph nodes, because they cause compression, can cause uh, narrowing and stenosis, especially in the upper lobe areas. Non-resolving x-rays, as I told you. And the thing to remember here is left main bronchus is more common than right because it is... Uh, narrower and longer, so more likely to get stenosed. And it has a lot of mediastinal structures around also, which can, uh, you know, hinder the um, expansion. The other important thing to remember here is that we have seen mostly in somehow people in their 20s to their, uh, you know, mid 40s. Very rarely does this happen in elderly patients or maybe elderly patients 
uh, you know, we don't see it as often. Most of my patients have been female patients. This is another recent patient who had come uh, to us at KM Hospital, who, as you can see, this is a very early X-ray uh, CT. This is a 2018 CT. You're seeing that there is um, this uh, left lower lobe consolidation with some amount of break breakdown. You're seeing this tree bud appearance. And this patient was putum positive, was uh, diagnosed as MDR-TB and was initiated on treatment. However, why I'm showing you this is because let us see what is happening at the airway. So this is what I'm saying about when you suspect and when you look out for it. Very often we miss it. And there is a learning curve to this. See this. This is the 2018 scan. Already the left main bronchus is looking narrowed. It is looking floppy. There is also some soft tissue component around it. You are seeing this thickening over here, which you're not seeing on the right side. And in these images, you're actually seeing endobronchial soft tissue. So this patient ideally should have undergone a scopy, if not immediately, at least, obviously, because she's sputum positive, she's drug resistant. There is some fear, theoretically, that if you do a scopy and you intervene, you're going to cause dissemination, take a biopsy, uh, do some intervention. But at three months, okay, in MDR-TB patients, definitely put in a scope at between three to six months based on what is there. A clinical picture. Now, this is a subsequent scan, which is there of 2019. As you can see, again, the airway has narrowed even further. You're seeing that the lower lobe has collapsed completely. The upper lobe is still expanded. And this is last year, October 21, when we had good images from Dr. Jankaria. And you can see that this is the normal caliber of the left main bronchus. But see, after the initial two centimeters, you're seeing that it is narrowed quite significantly. And you're also seeing some areas of collapse over here. This patient underwent a dilatation procedure at KM Hospital. You can see this is a PFT of November where the FVC has pre and post procedure. This uh, has shown an improvement in both the FVC and a very good improvement in DLCO. She had come to us with, again, wheezing, noisy breathing on exertion. On auscultation, she had monophonic um, we, uh, ronchus on the left side. And post-procedure, she has shown improvement in her symptoms. Now you cannot hear the monophonic ronchus on auscultation. However, we she's due for a repeat bronchoscopy where we will see if there is a need to intervene again. So remember, when you are doing these procedures based on the clinical picture, based on the clinical improvement, radiological improvement, and your bronchoscopy end result at that point in time, you will decide when you're going to repeat the procedure. Either you're going to repeat it within a month, if there is inadequate um, uh, therapeutic outcome at that point, even sometimes within 15 days, if there's a lot of slough which you need to uh, get out, if there is not good expansion on the uh, X-ray. And sometimes if there is good outcome, you may wait for three months to see whether it is holding, whether it is recurring, whether you may need to intervene again to cause further improvement. Again, again, word of caution, these procedures are very exciting, very uh, rewarding as well when you have these young patients who come back and thank you profusely for saying thank you doctor but please remember uh, again caution eat sitting do cautiously over dilatation over intervention because these are stenotic these are fibrotic stenosis okay these have a tendency to cause they are first of all more difficult to uh, uh, intervene with and secondly they can have more chances of complications like a fistula creation or a tracheal tear or a bronchial tear if you do an overzealous attempt. So what I'm trying to basically say with my talk is that one is suspect when you are going to have uh, these patients, pick the CT scan and clinical findings early to see when these are the patients who are undergoing stenosis, follow them up, do an early bronchoscopy, don't wait for the TB treatment to get over because by then we know that TB heals with fibrosis. So this, even the, in the airway, it is going to cause fibrosis and stenosis. And then that time it is going to be more difficult to intervene. Therefore, you don't, you don't, and the radiological collapse takes much longer. The airway starts narrowing much earlier. So please remember any suspicion, any radiological evidence, please, please, please look at it. Go back and look where you're seeing even some minimal narrowing over here with the thickening of the bronchial wall, then please 
go and put in a scope again after some time and see what you can do because initially you could get away with just a dilatation subsequently you may need to do cautery you may need to then reintervene again and again and you may these patients then because of they remain collapsed for a long time stenotic for a long time they will develop a preeclampsia or a bronchomalacia as well so with that i'm going to end my talk and we will move on to the panel discussion thank you so we are going to move on now with the panel discussion and uh, we are going to have a lot of exciting questions with that background of the talk so i'm going to start my first question to dr uh, samir arbat uh, we have a young female who has fever cough x ray showing patchy nodular shadows and the ct chest shows again bilateral nodular shadows some more on the left with some trained bud appearance however her sputum is negative So, what would you do next? Is there a role of a bronchial wash in diagnosis of palmitic tuberculosis, uh, Dr. Samir? Yes, ma'am. A very good evening, everyone. I am thankful to the organizers, uh, Dr. Krishna, for inviting me for this academic feast, and thankful to Dr. Kirat because she was very insistent that I should uh, be a part of CCI. So, this is my first program with CCI. so as per your question ma'am the patient already has undergone radiological investigation wherein we can see that there is a trean bud appearance the patient is sputum negative uh, almost uh, one third of the patients are known to not produce sputum when they have pulmonary tuberculosis there is a lot of evidence which comes in favor of induced sputum but still then 20% of patients with induced sputum are still not able to give a diagnosis at the same time we also risk the uh doctors or the technician around uh, getting uh, exposed to pulmonary tuberculosis so this is where bronchial washing comes in very handy what we need to understand here is there is also a role of uh, excluding any other diagnosis such as malignancy also the ct scan like one of your cases might not be actually correlating with the bronchoscopic picture so if there is any stenosis that we are anticipating that also can be seen the emphasis here is that we should not forget the culture so your uh, um gene expert is definitely helpful but if you are not doing a culture you might not get onto the drug sensitivity if the patient turns out to be a drug resistant tuberculosis so as bronchial washing has a definite role wherein we should subject the sample to uh, afb staining gene expert as well as culture sensitivity thank you samir for that uh, great answer so my next uh, question is for dr nagarjuna uh, so uh, we know that when we have miliary tuberculosis it may be a little more cumbersome so is there anything that you would add in the uh, diagnostic algorithm of bronchoscopy when you have miliary tuberculosis hi everyone uh, thank you madam i think this is a very in, in important thing for us to understand uh, so i think dr samir has spoken about the role of uh, bronchoalveolar lavage so basically we call it more of a bronchoalveolar lavage because we want the alveolar sample actually the for the for, for all the investigations but when we talk about miliary tb by definition miliary tb is an interstitial disease so we we don't expect to get a positive uh, bronchoalveolar lavage uh, for microbiological samples so when we have a ct which is consistent with miliary tb that is miliary nodules then we would always do a transbronchial lung biopsy because uh, in miliary tb what i expect is we don't expect bal to come positive we expect uh, granulomas to be there on the lung biopsy and the diagnosis would be more based upon the pathology than microbiology in miliary tuberculosis i think this is indifferent but again when we talking about miliary tb the most important thing is identifying the ct pattern many times uh, confluent and endobronchial central lobular nodules versus miliary random nodules i think that is where the differentiation has to be we should be good in interpreting the ct if we have confluent central lobular nodules and trained bud appearance then bal will definitely be positive if we have a miliary pattern random nodules then you should always want to do a lung biopsy and the differentials for miliary nodules are also broader 
we should also look at the size of the miliary nodules are they uniformly small or are the miliary nodules variable in size if you have miliary nodules are variable in size then the possibility of miliary malignancy or miliary meth miliary sarcoid also becomes higher in the list i think good seek interpretation will help us choose the investigation wisely when we are planning a bronchoscopy uh, great answer nagarjuna as usual very uh, efficiently put so just to follow up on that question uh, i have another quick question for you is the role of pneumothorax if you inadvertently take a uh, you know lung biopsy in confluent nodules it will be higher than a miliary tb because it is tuberculosis no i i i we, we don't see any increased risk of pneumothorax mm -hmm. uh, in patients with tuberculosis uh, in our experience i think it is the same as uh, uh, for other diseases okay why why i ask the question is because we had uh, a couple of patients who had retrospectively we realized that it was probably more of a nodular uh, you know conglomerate pattern rather than a miliary pattern one patient in fact very early on there was it was done by somebody else and pneumothorax was there in that patient so i'm just wondering because tuberculosis sometimes can have more caseation whether you know if you do it in the incorrect setting but it's good to know that you don't have that experience so that must have been a one off case i think so i just come to the discusses for i think for the for everyone's interest when we have a person who's sputum negative hmm. or sputum scars he is not producing a sputum so how would the uh, the panelists uh, put induced sputum versus bronchiolar lavage this is in the cost in this is just in the patient's interest so would would we still consider induced sputum before bronchiolar lavage or would we do a ball in the first sitting because i think i think the uh, experience across the centers would differ this is just for us to understand that there is a step ahead of ball there might be some people where induced sputum might give us a diagnosis also but definitely ball is superior to induced sputum is what i feel Definitely, Bale superior. Samir has. This is just to yes. promote discussion. Yeah. So yes. So there are uh, the recent paper uh, published. One recently, as uh, near as uh, May 2022, wherein they have placed uh, induced sputum to be just as effective as uh, uh, bronchial alveolar lavage. But I suppose the studies were uh, carried out in uh, different settings, different uh, Western countries. because a your uh, induction sputum induction should be carried out in the right manner which i believe a bronchial bronchial washing or bronchial alveolar lavage can be carried out in a more better way than actually carrying a sputum induction there's always a risk of uh, transmitting the disease to the people who are around while you are carrying out sputum induction and i think so in a uh, setting like india where in the patient might come to you once and might not come back to you again if he gets a negative diagnosis we should not uh, bother the patient by carrying out something which is not very reliable in our setting so bronchial washing or bronchial alveolar lavage is definitely the step to go i think i would agree with samar even we don't do much of induced sputum but then uh, people should uh, really understand that there is an option if you don't have access to a ball in remote settings you can still try an induced sputum in our setting also because we don't want to increase the waiting time we usually do a ball after a sputum negative also what i've seen is because now i am attached both to the pu public sector and the private sector somehow in the public sector they still try and induce sputum because i think maybe the cost effectiveness like in a private sector you again send the sputum for gene expert then again you do a bronchoscopy so it sometimes doesn't make any sense yes and even the time spent by the patient for yes. visiting a public sector hospital yes specifically a km opd which functions yes. on monday and thursday yes. would take up the same amount of money absolutely. undergoing a procedure absolutely. like this absolutely okay so the next question uh, what i have is for uh, dr samir is what what do you think is the role of medical thoracoscopy or what some would like to call thoracoscopy in the diagnosis of pleural tuberculosis when to do and what is the diagnostic yield so uh, recently there has been this one very interesting paper by dr panchal which is uh, modern management of unilateral pleural effusion so it is uh, there uh, for open download so uh, recently uh, uh, what is called as uh, local anesthetic uh, thoracic surgery lats as compared to vats is what is uh, 
useful for diagnosis of exudative pleural effusion without a known cause so basically this is where tuberculosis uh, tubercular pleural effusion comes in handy so your thoracoscopy medical thoracoscopy or pleuroscopy is uh, useful in diagnostic cases of tubercular pleural effusion uh, definitely it is also equally uh, yieldful when it comes to therapeutic procedures such as adhesiolysis or getting a biopsy as compared to vats uh, we just need to understand what are the resources available at a particular center wherein the patient should be subjected to just a thoracocentesis and uh, lights criteria should be followed should we go for a thoracoscopy or should we then send the patient for a surgical procedure that is vats so in theory the medical thoracoscopy is uh, equally effective as vats when it comes to diagnostic as well as therapeutic procedures in tubercular pleural effusion following the same question through i have a question for dr mohan so what which of these patients is likely to be referred to you for vats i think samir has said that uh, a limited procedure has a good diagnostic ability but what do you see in your practice which patients are are being sent to you for diagnosis So first of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for the opportunity. I am also the opening batsman. This is the first time I am participating in this CCA conference. And uh, uh, as far as the question is concerned, uh, so it is very rare uh, to directly present a pleural effusion patients to a thoracic surgeon. By the time they actually present to us, they, as uh, Dr. Samir said. somebody would have put uh, uh, icd somebody would have multiple aspirations and all the investigation would have been done and these days uh, people are doing medical thoracoscopy and usually the patients at these cases that were referred to us are either having multiloperated collections with impending sepsis or the actually converted into an empyema so around 90% of uh, 90 more than 90 95% of cases actually comes into in these uh, two categories only 3 or 5% of cases actually come with a uh, directly present to us with a uh, say with a pleural effusion if in uh, such cases where a patient comes to us with pleural effusion we don't aspirate what our unit protocol is that we put a uh, 20 french icd we try to drain the whole of the pleural cavity all the fluid will be drained out and uh, even a slightest suspicion of multiloculation uh, we go into the chest we do a diagnostic thoracoscopy we take biopsies and we uh, depending on the report we proceed with the uh, the report proceed with the treatment uh, that's a great purview from a surgeon considering that he is amidst uh, a lot of interventional pulmonologists uh, so my next question is specifically that what challenges would there be for you uh, if you had to do a vats in a patient who has pleural tuberculosis anything oh, that is I... different uh yeah definitely compared to the management of tubercular uh, empyema is uh, uh, difficult compared to the other kind of pleural effusions like uh, post pneumonic uh, effusions so i would like to quote uh, our own study of uh, 285 patients also in this uh, uh, particular question as i said our uh, patients are either multiloperated collections or empyema patients in most of the scenarios the first and foremost challenge in these patients is first of most of them are malnourished so we have to take care of the nutritional status before subjecting them for any kind of uh, surgical procedure and once we decided for the surgery we do a diagnostic thoracoscopy and because it's multi loculations there will be uh, the whole of the chest will be pleural cavity will be filled with uh, the purulent fluid or uh, with multi loculations we break the loculi and we remove the, all the pus inside the chest this part is called debridement however the story doesn't end here because the patient would have take around 3 to 4 weeks of for time from the time he developed the effusion till the time they come here to to our setup so by the time because of the chronic inflammation the patients will develop the the visceral as well as parietal pleura gets thickened so we had to address this mechanical cause also in uh, in addition to the microbiological the septic uh, component we have to deal with the the uh, the mechanical component which is uh, uh, restricting the uh, the uh, lung expansion so we had to do the decortication so the surgery decortication will have will have two components that is debridement as well as decortication the decortication would include the removal of the visceral as well as the thickened parietal pleat and we subject all these fluid and as well as the peel 
for uh, the uh, DF staining, the AFD culture and the gene expert. Both the samples will be uh, sent for the investigations. And I would like to quote our study. As I said, we did 285 cases, uh, microbiology analysis and uh, the stick. The stain positivity, uh, either in the fluid and the peel, is uh, less than 40%. To be exact, it is 36%. And the culture positivity in our series is less than 20%. To be approximate, it is 19.2%. So these are our cultures, uh, stain positivity and culture positivity uh, status. And if the patient is actually culture positive, we, we found that the patients are prone for prolonged day leaks. The patients are prone for uh, longer duration of ICDs after the surgery and the possibility of recollection is higher in such patients. Thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, I think, yes, Samir. Yeah, Go ahead. Uh, I think so. I would like Nagarjuna to also comment on this, but I believe patients who have uh, multi-loculated effusion, if the CT scan is showing a thick peel, a thick visceral peel, uh, these are the patients that I would say should not uh, be subjected to medical thoracoscopy and should be referred to a surgeon because there's hardly much that we can do other than just draining the fluid or taking a biopsy. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think yes, I, I would agree with Samir also that uh, visceral, visceral uh, plural is something which is best left to a surgeon. Though there are a handful of uh, pulmonologists who are venturing into the surgical zone, but I would uh, strongly say that uh, uh, a medical thoracoscopy would uh, stay away from uh, the visceral pleura and would only focus more on the adhesions and the parietal pleural biopsies, basically. And I think just one, one, one point I would like to add, madam, that uh, when to do a medical thoracoscopy for diagnosing the tuberculous pleural effusion. I think this is something which, which is very important for us to understand that uh, not all cases of uh, pleural effusion need a medical thoracoscopy. So what uh, we follow and what uh, we have postulated earlier in our publications also is that to stratify effusions based on ADA levels. I think pleural fluid ADA is the most important thing which would uh, help us determine the need of a diagnostic medical thoracoscopy. So if, if it's an exudative uh, pleural effusion and ADA more than 70, no other etiology is identified, usually we would start off uh, ATT, we wouldn't do a thoracoscopy. Below 40 ADA, all, we, we will always do medical thoracoscopy, ADA between 40 to 70, depending upon the clinical scenario, we will decide whether to whether not to do a medical thoracoscopy. I think this is something which I wanted to just add on to what Dr. Samir has already said. I think so that's an interesting... To, just wanted to add, uh, uh, so as far as the visceral decortication is concerned, it is uh, one of the most difficult uh, procedure that to do because uh, the thickened peel actually is densely adherent to the underlying lung parenchyma. So if uh, inadvertent, uh, very fast kind of doing this procedure will definitely lead to the tears over the lung surface and leads to the prolonged day leak. So actual, uh, the proper decortication uh, for a stage 3 empyema will usually take around 6 to 7 hours. So uh, very experienced centers with experienced people should be doing such kind of, uh, if anybody wants to do visceral decortication, it should be in a, uh, a definitely uh, experienced centers. Yeah, just to recapitulate what everybody has said, I think because uh, there have been a lot of points and count across, I think medical thoracoscopy for diagnosis, as Nagarjuna has said, that in our country, we have a specific issue because patients have to pay for these procedures often by themselves. In the West, of course, and in other literature, they say that you should have a biopsy diagnosis and they don't play that much importance to ADA. But in our country, yes, ADA does play an important role. When you do, if you need to do and you do a, a pleuroscopic biopsy, the yield of a biopsy tissue for expert as well as culture is much higher. In fact, histopathology could be as high as 100% uh, diagnostic for tuberculosis, uh, which is much lesser in the plural fluid uh, culture and gene expert. As far as thick adhesions are concerned, I think one should, is very tempting when you're going in and you have thick adhesions to try and meddle with them. But I think it is safest to stay away because not just with the visceral, uh, you know, thick and plural, if you have thick adhesions, even otherwise, if you try and pull them very often, you can cause tears in the lung. So please, please remember that only if there are thin septations when you go and uh, try and tackle them, don't try and tackle, take adhesions and leave them for the surgeon. 
My next question would be back to Nagarjuna. So, when would EBS be indicated in diagnosis of mediastinal lymph node tuberculosis and the yield? And a second question that here is needle size and the type relevant in tuberculosis, like it is in malignancy. I think uh, Maran, you started off with the EBS cases. You have shown two cases of uh, EBS where uh, TB was the diagnosis. So now I think the way EBS is kicking off, uh, EBS is going to be become the second bronchoscope. Uh, I'm I'm very sure that uh, uh, all the cities, all the second dead cities, also have an EBUS now. And when EBUS is indicated for mediastinal lymphadenopathy for all cases, when if you don't have any other site where we can get a diagnosis, if lymph nodes are the main site of disease, then definitely EBUS is the investigation of choice. Mediastinoscopy has now. I don't. I think it is. It's a. It's a dying art. I'm sorry, Dr. Mohan is there, but then. Uh, EBUS has taken over medicinoscopy uh, uh, in all always. So uh, the EBUS is something which is done day in and day out. And uh, when it comes to diagnostic yield, EBUS has replaced conventional TBNA also. Uh, the, the, the diagnostic yield is uh, very good. But if you look at the literature, uh, the diagnostic yield of EBUS for malignancy is actually better than diagnostic yield of EBUS for granulomas. This is very interesting. It is said that for, for diagnosing adenocarcinoma malignancy or staging, the diagnostic yield is to the tune of 95 to 97%. But when it comes to granulomas, it is a bit lower. It would be uh, somewhere between 80-85%, which means that you can still miss 15% of granulomas if we rely only on EBUS TBNA. So this is where we are. But then we are still diagnosing 80-85% of granulomas by doing EBUS. So when we do EBUS, I think there are two things which I would like to stress. Again, it's always clinical, pathologic, microbiologic and radiologic. There are four things you correlate when you want to get a diagnosis. So you, you look for granulomas on pathology. And then you also, as Dr. Samir and Dr. Mohan have rightly said, that microbiology plays a huge role in India. So you always have to send AFB smear, gene expert. Now it is expert ultra. Expert ultra is taking for experts, expert ultra and MTB culture. So all three have to be sent in every EBUS when you get granulomas. And if any of these is positive, then it would become tuberculosis. So uh, the second thing is uh, how we do at our center when we, we change our algorithms as, as the, the data evolves, as the technologies evolve. So earlier, way back, we were doing EBUS without ROS. Once ROS has started, now all our EBUSes are with rapid onset evaluation. So it, not all centers have ROS. There are centers who train themselves, the pulmonologists become the pathologists, so where they have pros. So the pathologist actually tells us immediately whether you are finding a granuloma or no granuloma. Once the pathologist says there are granulomas, then we take two to three additional passes from the node which has the best granulomas yield. Suppose there are three nodes and the pathologist says subcarinal has the best granuloma, then we take three passes exclusively for microbiology. So you take these three passes in saline for microbiological investigations. Then the second modification which we have done over the last one year is, if the pathology says that the rose is inconclusive, it's reactive, then and there we do a biopsy. So from EBUS TBNA, we move to EBUS biopsy. Whatever is the technique which we prefer, either a cryobiopsy or a forceps biopsy, we do a biopsy. And then we have we just looked at our data of uh, the last six months, around 120 cases of EBUS, which we had done. Uh, around 30 cases, we ended up doing uh, medicinal crab biopsy, where the rose was inconclusive. And in up to 60% of them, we could get an additional diagnosis. So now there is a new step. So you have an undiagnosed lymph node, you do EBUS TBNA. Then if EBUS TBNA is inconclusive, then you do EBUS biopsy. If EBUS biopsy also is inconclusive, which actually happens in around 30% of cases when you do EBUS biopsy, then you have to decide whether they're true reactive nodes or you have missed the sample, missed the diagnosis. That is where is the role of medicinoscopy probably. 
I think this is how the approach to medicinal infundopathy is being changing over the years. I think this. I think I won't take much time. This is all. This is all I have to say. Uh, that's a completely elaborate answer. Now, quick. Uh, this thing is: Have you seen Nagarjuna that if you aspirate pus, at least that more likely you will get a microbiology positive. So I, when I aspirate pus, you know I'm happy because I've never had a problem with a microbiological diagnosis. At least that is very. You may not get granulomas on the. Uh, on the pathology there because there's too much necrosis so they just report it as non specific madam, necrosis madam see more often than not when you aspirate a pus like material mm -hmm. in india it is considered to be synonymous with tuberculosis tuberculosis what yes. want of finger sometimes in highly necrotic masses highly necrotic right. malignancies also we have mm -hmm. aspirated similar pus like material so i think but but that is only in a handful of uh, patients so more often than not the clinical scenario fits in Uh, for tuberculosis, and you aspirate first, then you are happy. Again, how Indian scenario is different from Western scenario as far as EBOS is concerned. It's a small example when you look at the endosonographic characteristics. If you look at the Western literature, they say if you have a heterogeneous node, it is more likely to be malignancy. But in India, if you find a heterogeneous node, it is more likely to be tuberculosis. Absolutely. Really, if you have a coagulation necrosis sign in outside yeah. India, it is malignancy, but in India, it is tuberculosis. Absolutely. It is. It is the country where you practice. You have to adapt to your uh, own scenarios. Absolutely. Uh, you have anything to add, Samir? No, I. I just. I just forgot one point, uh, which uh, is relevant to this whole discussion. Is scope sterilization? Whenever you are talking about tuberculosis. If the scope is not sterilized well, you might get a lot of patients who are basically diagnosed as uh, pulmonary TB. Sure. So coming back after that elaborate discussion on EBS, is there any patient who you would still do a conventional TB NA on, Samir? Is there any patient in whom you think that there would still be a role now that we are moving more and more towards EBS availability? I think so. This is again relevant to the. Uh, the hospital and the resources that are available so what we learned during our uh, post graduation days when we did not have the ebus uh, with us so is basically any station 7 which is uh, seen bronchoscopically as a widened uh, carina is something that somebody can go for uh, the conventional tbna they they say there is still a lot of uh, role of conventional tbna because not every center eventually would be having a ebus machine but if there is any ebus then i don't see any uh, reason for going for a conventional tbn i think uh, dr pratibha madam's uh, uh, video has gone on mute in the meanwhile uh, there is a message from uh, uh, dr krishna sir about the number of logins i think it has touched 1000 already so this is a very good number and uh, we have to thank the audience also for uh, being with us till 9 o'clock i think till dr pratibha joins back i think we'll take the discussion forward is it okay dr samir yes yeah yes. i think we have discussed about uh, the role of uh, bronchiolar lavage the role of thoracoscopy the role of linear ebus but then what is the role of uh, uh, bronchoscopy in peripheral lesions suppose you have a nodule so i think this this i would ask dr samir uh, what is the role of uh, how often do we end up uh, diagnosing tuberculosis in this peripheral pulmonary lesions in india i think they are very common and how would you approach them sorry so, i think i got locked off yeah sorry i got locked off we locked just off for uh, took over your role and we started no, no, absolutely go ahead go ahead continue <laughs> sorry uh, no no go ahead more than happy you can continue your discussion Yeah, I'll just I'll just wrap it up quickly. So uh, we have published a data of around uh, around sixty cases who were subjected to uh, transbronchial uh, cryo biopsy for peripheral lesions, and in the Indian setting, a good thirty percent of patients turned out to be tuberculosis, which obviously, when you see in the Western data, is usually uh, malignant. So I think so uh, for peripheral lesions. which are not radiologically very uh, diagnostic of malignancy can turn out to be tuberculosis in india yes ma'am that so we just had one question on peripheral lesions i think no. you can take over the discussion yes yes so my next question is for you nagarjuna that have what about 
tracheal bronchial tb in your experience have you faced any uh, dilemmas or any bronchoscopic perils that you would want to again reiterate i think this is something which you had uh, elaborated uh, in in depth so i would uh, agree with most of the things which you had said um what i would say is probably we are under diagnosing yes a lot of especially endo endo bronchial endotracheal tuberculosis i would say is an under diagnosed uh, entity which is very obvious because you don't end up doing bronchoscopy for all sputum positive tbs and also it is not justified to bronchoscope and see all patients of sputum positive tuberculosis so what we are actually diagnosing is a very 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 small subset of so called endobronchial tuberculosis and we discuss about that small subset of endobronchial tuberculosis now most of them i would feel would respond to att except a small subset of them again which would present to us you have shown lot of uh, videos so how to suspect and when to suspect endobronchial tuberculosis there are no guidelines only clinical pointers you had already mentioned some of them one being monophonic wheeze uh second i would also want to add disproportionate symptoms as compared to radiology if the radiology is not very bad but the person is vigorously coughing then probably he has endobronchial tuberculosis that is one thing third uh, when the person is clinically improving but radiologically not improving probably again you are dealing with an endobronchial obstruction when you want to look for endobronchial obstruction uh pfts are something which are not done in patients with tuberculosis so you cannot rely on pfts again so more often than and fourth is ct scans done incidentally pick up the the pointers of endobronchial disease and you end up doing a scopy these are some of the times when you would do or when you do bronchoscopy for diagnosing and you end up seeing an um, very significant endobronchial lesion so uh, that is about uh, thing but more more important is the post infective sequelae that is i think probably the most important thing when people come with a fibrosynotic form of tuberculosis in our experience as you had rightly said it is always young thin girls 80% of them hmm? this is the typical on the left side left main bronchus on the left and left main bronchus main bronchus so they the two things left main bronchus is 3 to 4 times more common than right main bronchus second point i would like to add is that it is multi level usually tubercular sinusitis is multi level you end up having small lower tracheal narrowing left main narrowing and then one distal lobe or segment being narrowed so it's usually two or three places which are usually there so it's a multi level stenosis third is the fact that the cartilages are always involved so it is not a simple membranous stenosis it is a complex cartilaginous stenosis that is where the problems come in that is about diagnosis then as far as treatment is concerned we uh, as madam has uh, shown uh, the it's always the balloon bronchoplasty dilatation and then series series of dilatations it is usually not one dilatation you tend to do 3 to 4 sittings of dilatation and what we had seen is of all the lmb stenosis we have had because of tuberculosis we had to actually stent only one most of them if you are if you are patient and the patient is patient and then you do serial dilatations over months then you would end up having a patent airway you may not have a anatomically normal airway but you would have a functionally okay airway so the person would be able to breathe the person would not have breathlessness but the bronchus will not be 14 mm it might be 8 mm but we are okay with it so that is what we do we we do series of dilatations and stenting for bronchial tb is something which we do as a last maybe after the third dilatation again the fourth dilatation happens so there again coming then maybe you would want to put a temporary stent and that also only for a couple of months and then we take the problem is with the tracheal tuberculosis if you have a stenotic tracheal a tracheal stenosis because of tuberculosis then it becomes life threatening bronchial stenosis is non life threatening so i think uh, 
tracheal stenosis is something where if it recurs for more than second time we would want to place a temporary silicone tracheal stent and then we would take it out again if dr mohan is there definitely if it's a short segment we would send him for tracheal resection surgery only when resection surgery is not possible we should actually go for a tracheal stenting for a benign disease so even for uh, tracheal stenosis tuberculosis we hardly have one or two cases where we had to actually intervene most of them stabilize with series of dilatations and att i think uh, one last thing i forgot to say is as far as the type of stenosis in tuberculosis a combination of malacian stenosis again is very common this yeah. again because the cartilage gets involved you have some areas which are malacian some areas which are stenotic so tuberculous stenosis is characterized by multi level stenosis complex stenosis involving the cartilage combined stenosis and malacian i think others also would agree with what i tell yeah absolutely nagarjuna in fact one of my videos you could see that post dilatation it was a little floppy but somehow it still managed to remain its patency adequately enough for the patient to uh, you know breathe well and not uh, be symptomatic so just to follow that i think nagarjuna has already laid the uh seed for my next question to uh, dr mohan what would be your role in tracheobronchial tuberculosis what what are the kind of patients that you would want us to refer to so uh, as uh, dr nagarjuna very elaborately presented that uh, uh, either the tubercular involvement of the trachea or the left main bronchus which we commonly see so although there are so many bronchoscopic methods like uh, dilatation you put stent uh, you not put stent so many things can be used but there are some uh, negative aspects uh, or flaws of this uh, bronchoscopic interventions which can be these are not at all the 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 methods are not standardized in a way that you know how many uh, bronchoscopic dilatations needs to be done after how many dilatations if the disease is progressing or worsening when to refer to a surgeon is there any need to put a stent not put a stent which type of stent uh, to be placed and uh, if you put a stent how many months you have to wait and you know that the when a stent is instituted it has its uh, own stent related complications everything so so surgery has definitely a role in the management of uh, this the tracheal tubercular stenosis as well as left main bronchus stenosis even we have published our data 25 cases and after that we published we did uh, another five cases total 30 cases of uh, tracheobronchial stenosis we uh, operated and we published our data and the in left main bronchus stenosis the, the data shows that uh, the longer the duration of the symptoms the patient is having and the more number of interventions that you do the possibility of lung preservation goes down so recently we did a case again the similar kind of case that you showed the only the left main bronchus is involved again a female young female and the left main bronchus involvement she is uh, she is very lean and that lady so after 6 months of uh, att the the patient, the symptoms are not uh, responding so we had to do left main bronchus sleeve resection where we cut the uh, bronchus at the level of carina and at the level of secondary carina and implant the secondary carina over the primary carina so this is called left main bronchus sleeve resections so this can be performed so it is a therapeutic option even the one of the lobar bronchus is also involved along with the one main bronchus so we can do uh, sleeve lobectomy where we can implant a lobar bronchus over the uh, primary carina so these surgeries that we have presented and it's a very interesting paper that we published in lung india and even uh, said so uh, you know in the management of tracheal stenosis the one main important that we have to uh, see that is the length of involvement should not be more than 50% of total length of trachea that excludes uh, uh, the any kind of surgical internal such cases so the first of all the prerequisites are the patient should be uh, uh, the patient should be afb negative and uh, uh, the bronchoscopic yes definitely i agree that initial one or two times the bronchoscopic intervention should be done we have to wait and then if it fails then definitely if the in trachea if it is a length is less than 50% we should go for surgical resection and in case of left main bronchus uh, stenosis i think uh, sleeve resection will definitely offer because it's a one time procedure and it's an effective procedure the prob another problem with bronchoscopy is that you have to do four times five times six times seven times don't know depending on the the progression of the disease the multiple admissions multiple uh, interventions so that is one uh, aspect that we have to see this way 
uh, any thoughts uh, nagarjuna thank you mohan for that uh, uh, this thing it's samir yes i can see your hand is raised yeah actually the problem arises when the patient is afp positive so yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. Positive, the afp positive there is no point of saying that and these yeah. patients usually do turn out to be afp positive on presentation yeah uh any thoughts nagarjuna any inputs no, i think i think whatever dr mohan has said is perfect that if the person is uh, uh cured from tuberculosis and has recurring tracheal stenosis and access to a good surgeon then definitely surgical resection would be the first uh, treatment of choice and the person is oh uh, is there any specific type of stent that you would put nagarjuna if you needed to put it but as i have said uh, uh, stenting in any benign stenosis is the last option for yes. us yes yes so but if 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 we have if at all we have to place a stent for whatever reason either a person is unresectable or inoperable then we would always go for a silicone stenting only for a benign tracheal stenosis absolutely i just wanted to highlight this point because very often there are patients who are referred for uh, stent complications where for a benign disease they have uh, you know a metallic stent has been inserted so i mean that is something that i do want to reiterate that please for if at all you need to put in a stent for benign conditions which should be the last resort if you are out of running out of options then please do not insert a uh a, a metallic stent for sure uh, so coming back to samir uh, what do you think is the role of pleurodesis in tuberculosis you know it's i mean pleurodesis has been traditionally defined as a relative contraindication for infectious cases but in tuberculosis specifically where do you think it has a role with my study of all the literature i don't think so there is any role of pleurodesis in any of the tubercular cases obviously you are uh, putting the patient and the surgeon if ever required into a nightmare situation and uh, it's best reserved for uh, malignant cases wherein we know that the prognosis is very poor or the uh, life span is less or it's a recurrent uh, filling okay any, any role i would like if any if uh, nagarjun or anybody has any yeah. different view I because think i have a recurrent pneumothorax and miliary tuberculosis would you consider it nagarjun no see i think pleurodesis okay i think dr pratibha has brought up a different thing for pleural effusion in tuberculosis it will respond yes. to att so yes. I, i i don't know non mumbai it will respond if it's an yes. mcr pleural effusion i don't know but <laughs> in in a drug sensitive pleural tuberculosis it will respond but if it's a, a pneumothorax a tuberculous causing secondary spontaneous pneumothorax yeah, then yes for all secondary spontaneous pneumothorax you have to do pleurodesis so you will do pleurodesis as is the norm provided there is no bronchopleural fistula or anything but then i think uh, i think that, that is one of the indication we do come across lot of uh, secondary pneumothorax because of tubercular cavities so i think uh, i think the point is taken that if it's a secondary spontaneous pneumothorax because of tuberculosis you should uh, do pleurodesis sure thank you coming back to you on that same question because you mentioned tuberculous a bronchopleural fistula is there a role of a bronchoscopic uh, closure in these patients and okay. if yes when yes see again if yes if dr mohan says no only then yes <laughs> <laughs> so for all any bronch it's there is a difference between an alveolar pleural fistula and a bronchopleural fistula it's usually if it's a small cavity or a small leak it usually resolve but if it's a bronchopleural fistula wherein the bronchus is directly communicating with the pleural cavity then uh, always we will involve the surgeon first and only if the surgeon says the person is unfit or a, the after surgery it's post surgery there is a bronchopleural fistula that is also common see because not every surgeon is as skilled as dr mohan here we get a lot of reference for post op bronchopleural fistula okay see it is it is not that there is a surgical issue it is just that it can happen if you doing on an infected case you can have a bronchopleural fistula Yes. even in such post op bronchopleural fistula the first recommendation is resurgery yes, you you have to open and again try to close it only when that is not possible then comes it all of bronchoscopic techniques uh i don't know see from our uh, experience we, even though we had come across uh, bpfs it is not a very significant number 
uh, I think Dr. Mehta has a huge publications uh, from India on Indian pig gods, customized pig gods, and other things. But uh, somehow at our setup, we don't come very often across uh, tubercular bronchopleural fistula. I think to add to that, basically the mainstay for this is uh, give it time and give it adequate anti appropriate anti TB treatment. I think most of them do heal with time. They just take longer to heal than other. Uh, alveolar pleural fistulas or bronchopleural fistulas, but definitely there is a persistent BPF. What challenges do you face surgically, Dr. Mohan? And uh, you know, when would when do you think is the right time to operate on these patients? Because as Nagarjuna has already said, that in infected cases there is again a re increase incidence of post uh, post operative persistent leaks or recurrence of uh, the fistulas. Uh, as Dr. Nagarjun rightly said, I'm very happy that uh, he initially itself he highlighted the differentiation between uh, bronchopleural fistula and alveolar fistula because most of uh, even pneumothoraces, the peripheral air leaks, people will say the patient is having bronchopleural fistula, which is not right actually. As for the definition, it is the the primary, secondary, and the tertiary commu bronchus communication with the pleural cavity is bronchopleural fistula, and rest all we categorize as alveolar. So uh, when a patient is having a bronchopleural fistula, probably tubercular, so eventually, definitely these patients are definitely will be having uh, an empyemothoracis because air will be leaking into the pleural cavity and uh, they will be having uh, empyemothoracis. So we, uh, although in the preoperative CT scan, we can assess the bronchopleural fistula, but uh, uh, sometimes uh, during while decortication, removing the uh, peel from the uh, lung surface, we actually see a hole over the lung from which the air will be leaking after completion of the decortication. So the type of uh, procedure that we, how to tackle the uh, bronchopleural fistula depends on where this bronchopleural fistula is actually located. If the bronchopleural fistula along with, usually it is associated with, uh, uh, a, uh, associated with a small kind of lung abscess over the, uh, in the, uh, the lung so that we have to, if it is peripheral, we have to do a bed resection and manage this, manage this uh, peripheral bronchopleural fistula. However, if it is uh, in the uh, one of the uh, lobar bronchus, the patient may actually need lobectomy also. So this uh, need for lobectomy is actually contrary to what the decortication, uh, the purpose is. So the purpose of decortication is uh, to eliminate the, the plural, eliminate the space, the plural space. But in the contrary, you do decortication and actually doing a lobectomy and it, which will eventually lead to uh, develop, uh, you know, uh, resistant, the, the uh, plural cavity, uh, residual plural cavity inside, which actually complicates the matter. So depending on the location, either it will be a wedge resection or lobectomy, or sometimes we actually uh, take a muzzle flaps from the either intercostal muzzle flap or some other muzzle flap, and we actually uh, repair the bronchopleural fistula and reinforce with those muscle flaps. So these are uh, two or three options that we actually manage how these bronchopleural fistulas. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohan. Uh, my next question is to Dr. Uh, Samir. Which sputum positive pulmonary tuberculosis patient would you refer for surgery? Yeah, so a very interesting question. There's a long list. Uh, I'll try to remember all of them. So basically, any patient who has a uh, tracheal or bronchial constriction, which is not web like, so basically an elong elongated constriction, patients who are uh, presenting with hemoptysis. Recurrent hemoptysis after intervention. Patients who have undergone uh, balloon bronchoplasty and still are presenting with uh, reconstriction. Patients who have a large uh, cavity presenting as a fungal ball and uh, anything else. And I think uh, patients also who have who continue to remain sputum positive, I think with a unilateral cavitary disease, sometimes. Uh, as a last resort, after giving adequate treatment, if they continue to be sputum positive, one could refer them potentially for surgery. We, we had we had one case of XDRTB whom we had uh, then he had a ca unilateral yes. cavity and he was also referred yes. for surgery. Yes, yes, correct. Uh, do you have any thoughts, Nagarjuna, in this? Any? No, I was just about to add the MDRTB. Yes, Where absolutely. The MDRTB surgery is uh, yes. to expedite the cure cure rates. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, we do have a lot of questions in the question box. So maybe uh, we could go through uh, some of them. I think uh, there is a question by uh, Dr. Reddy, uh, three-month-old baby bought to 
uh, operative consultation with a history of mother diagnosed with pleural TB diagnosed 10 days back and a mother not having cough but the baby on uh, breastfeeding what what would be the what would you do for the baby what advice would you give the mother and the child uh, any thoughts on that nagarjuna no there was some problem with my internet i'm very sorry i didn't get okay. the question properly this is a 3 month old baby who has who has uh, who's on breastfeeding and uh, the mother has just been diagnosed with pleural tb 10 days ago but there is no cough so i guess the the so question is i think nh prophylaxis is something which would be recommended for the recommend child recommended for the child yes am i audible yes you are audible it? yes you are audible no i think in, if the mother is positive even though she doesn't have cough the child would still be kept on an ice nh uh, prophylaxis but i would also take the opinion of a pediatrician before i take a decision on it absolutely great so this is a question from dr tridip chatterjee uh, from extra pulmonary samples like lymph nodes do you process for lpa directly from the sample or do it do you do it from the uh, tb majid culture once there is growth uh, samir any thoughts on that please uh can you hear me samir uh i think samir can't hear me there's some gap uh nagarjuna do you have any thoughts on that no i think the audio clarity somehow has become bad i'm not able to get the questions correctly hold on Are you able to hear me better now? Little better, but uh, I think Dr. Mohan's is the best. Okay. uh so coming back to the questions uh there is a question on uh, by dr sudeep chatterji asking if for extra pulmonary lymph node samples uh, for example mediastinal lymph node would you send the lpa directly or would you do the do it from uh, when once you have a growth on the uh, tb culture is the yield different in extra pulmonary sample i guess that is what is the question I think it's a very interesting question for which uh, probably we may not have a clear answer. Uh, what we do, we usually don't send LPA in the first instance. We usually send gene expert, rely more on expert. I think this is in our setup, and now we have ex access to expert XDR, expert MDR. Mm, so we, if if you have a expert positive and you're suspecting the uh, uh, mdr or an xdr the next thing which we are running now is the uh, expert xdr rather than the lpa now but i think dr pratibha from mumbai uh, where the resistance rates are higher uh, would you routinely do an lpa on all samples so we don't routinely do an lpa on all samples though now i think the national program does recommend that you should do an lpa as well because sometimes you may miss inh mono resistance uh you know and there is an there is a reasonably you do see cases of inh mono resistance but i think here the lpa results some on occasion when we have sent it from lymph node samples or extra pulmonary sites the results are not as great as when you send a sputum sample so uh it's possible that sometimes you may not not uh, you know the yield may be lesser as compared to the sputum samples i mean what i meant is the pulmonary samples um is what is my take on this maybe dr uh, samir wants to comment what is your yeah. take dr samir uh, i think so this varies from city to city but uh, certain labs like srl have this thing wherein you can if you send the uh, culture with uh, the lp at the same time they have a certain i, I don't know exactly but i think so 6000 is what they charge so 
patients whom we which are who are highly suspicious where you are suspecting that the patient might be mdr or xdr are the only patients where i believe we can directly send the patient for the sample for lpa yeah when it comes to lpa one more thing we should rem remember is that uh, there is uh, also the role of uh, quality of lab unlike uh, expert which is completely quant uh, automated, automated if you get it from a lab which is not very good then you tend to get erroneous uh, lpa results also because interpreting lpa there is some subjectivity involved and it is not as simple as a gene expert so when ordering lpa we should also look at the quality of uh, lab and their expertise in uh, performing line progress say. i think the answer for the question would be there is no clear cut answer actually but uh, as far as extra pulmonary posse bacillary samples are concerned the yield of lpa is probably lesser than gene yes. expert Yes. And only in select cases where you have a strong suspicion of INH mono resistance would you want to order LPA directly. LPA always can be ordered on a culture uh, positive sample if at all required. And now with the onset of with, with increasing availability of expert XPR, I think uh, slowly this LPA will be uh, going back, going behind this uh, new expert XTRs. Sure, that's a great uh, summation. So there is a question from Dr. Sanjeev Singhal asking, is it possible for sputum gene expert to be positive, but bowel fluid to be negative? Interesting question. Your thoughts, Samir? Uh, I don't know if somebody actually went ahead and uh, did a study on the, but I think so every study has been focusing on how uh, the bowel is superior to the sputum sample. So and usually I, if you have a positive sputum, you would not do a, do a bronchoscopy, no, right? Madam, post bronchoscopy sputum. <laughs> so in fact, there is data that uh, following bronchoscopy, the yeah. person coughs, you collect sputum from that thing, post bronchoscopy yes. sputum, it is also supposed to have a good diagnostic yield. Yes. So probably the situation where Bahal is negative, sputum positive, yeah. in one such instance. But uh, other I think he's asking that sputum was initially positive, but Bahal negative. I'm just saying that if the sputum was positive, you would not do a scopy. I think Bahal must not have been done from proper segment. Yes. I think so. The, the scopy was not performed well. The sample collection was not done properly. So technical or, errors and site of sample, processing of sample, and uh, depending upon maybe expertise also. And we yeah. have seen uh, all kind of these abnormal uh, interactions like uh, inside the chest, the fluid was positive, the peel was negative, peel was positive, fluid was negative, the strain was negative, culture was positive, strain was positive, culture was all kind of uh, associations we found. So anything can happen that <laughs> can be is possible. Yeah. But if you feel Nagarjuna has raised a very good point is that if you feel that your bowel, uh, that your washing return and your bowel return is not looking, uh, turbid is looking very as clean as a saline that you instilled, then please do go ahead and do uh, request a post uh, bronchoscopy sputum sample. You may be surprised. Uh, Dr. Tridip has another question. Use, usefulness of cyanoacrylic glue in uh, hemoptysis patients uh, bronchoscopically for uh, as a therapeutic Yes, Samir, please. So there are many interventions for hemoptysis. Uh, till now, there is, I won't say there is a definite consensus on the uh, volumic uh, distribution of mild, moderate and severe. Everybody, every guideline has a different uh, thing for that. I think so we should decide uh, intervention on the effect that the hemoptysis has. Uh, obviously, securing the airway is one, uh, cold saline is another. Cyanoacrylate uh, glue, I would say, is something which needs to be used very carefully in very uh, selected cases. It is, I would still say, it is not uh, not at all useful in massive hemoptysis, maybe mild to moderate, because uh, obviously it, it again depends. Are you there in the main bronchus? Are you going distal to it? Uh, there's a high risk of uh, damaging your scope, so expertise also plays a role. And what you are doing is basically you are uh, permanently altering the mucosal uh, structure of that particular segment. So I think so it should be reserved for very selective cases. So I would say it should be the last uh, one of the last interventions to be done for hemoptysis. 
I don't know. I may be biased because uh, as surgeons, we see the failures. So we have operated uh, many cases where uh, for uh, mild to moderate hemoptysis, as Dr. Samir said, so glue was put for twice, thrice, and then uh, the patient was referred because uh, the hemoptysis is not uh, controlled. So maybe I'm biased because uh, the effectivity of this, uh, the, the one who does it will, will be definitely able to tell it. But uh, we'll see more failures. That's what I can say as I said. I, I think so. It, it is still more of a cowboy approach uh, in comparison to the spigots and other uh, interventions. Yeah. And obviously, so we, are, think, we are introducing yeah. a foreign body also. Another thing is you are introducing a foreign body. I think the glue overall, earlier when we didn't have other better techniques available, it was being used. But now we have better uh, instruments available. So a uh, couple of questions uh, are, if pleural fluid ADA is negative, then what do you do? I think it has already been covered that you would go ahead and this would be an indication for doing a, a th medical thoracoscopy and taking a biopsy to diagnose pleural tuberculosis. Um, one interesting question has come up, which is the role of bronchoscopy in sputum positive gene expert negative cases. Uh, any thoughts on that, Nagarjuna? Sputum positive, gene expert negative. Yes, sputum uh, AAB uh, positive, gene expert negative, role of bronchoscopy. It's not about role of bronchoscopy, then you think of non tuberculous mycobacteria. Great. When you think of non tuberculous mycobacteria, one sputum is not sufficient. So you have to have at least two sputums or you have to have a bulb. So in such a case, then if you want to confirm, there's nothing wrong in going and doing a bulb. To confirm that even BAL is AFB smear positive and expert negative, and if uh, it turns out to be the same, then I think you would uh, call it as NTM, wait for the culture, and then type to speciate, and then start treatment accordingly. Sure. Or, okay. if, or the other possibility is that the expert has not been processed properly. Okay. So I think it's the clinical scenario which is important. And uh, you know, earlier olden days, we used to say that if you get an AFB positive then, and you're not suspecting, then it could be false positive. <laughs> you could have food particles, all those, how you collect the sample, all those funny things, or it could sometimes be uh, no cardia, which looks like TB, which has been reported as tuberculosis. So always look at the clinical scenario. Um, so a lot of questions from Dr. Tridip, or some of them could be regarded as comments, basically, when we were talking about endobronchial TB and fibrostenosis. So I think Nagarjuna has probably answered most of them. Uh, another question from Dr. Parikshit that despite serial balloon bronchoplasties, if there is recurrent TB bronchostenosis, I think there, that is where uh, Dr. Mohan's role comes in and you should refer the patient to a surgeon if the patient has uh, recurrent stenosis and is symptomatic. Mm. I think we've kind of finished most of our questions. Uh, let me just check if there are any new questions that have been posted. Meanwhile, any comments that, uh, yeah. So there is a good question here about a trap lung current management by Dr. Uh, Sanjib. Uh, Samir and Dr. Mohan, would you like to take this please? Oh, the trap lung, it should be decorticated. In a benign disease, the lung is trapped. The vis you have to remove the visceral pill. There is no yes. alternative for that. There is no other option to this. Yeah, Absolutely. I would refer, refer the patient directly to the search. Absolutely. So this is one of the indications where you would not think twice about sending the patient to a surgeon in an infectious uh, case like tuberculosis. Uh, any other inputs or discussions from uh, the audience? There is one question regarding pericardial effusion. I have seen somewhere. Uh, yes, I, I think I'm trying to find it because I went below. Hold on. I think it's right at the end. Are you being able to see? Yeah, strategy for managing tubercular pericardial effusion, new concepts. So probably uh, uh, being thoracic surgeons, we get referrals. I'm saying about the surgical aspects. So we get referral for uh, recurrent pericardial effusions as well for uh, thoracoscopic uh, pericardial window. 
So this is uh, uh, where the recurrent pericardial effusions will happen and multiple times aspiration, sometimes put, they put uh, catheters into the pericardial cavity, but still the pericardial effusion will recur. So in such situations, uh, thoracoscopic pericardial window is a an accepted in a, is a good procedure where we thoracoscopically go into the chest. We remove a four to five centimeters of pericardium above the phrenic nerve and below the phrenic nerve so that the pericardial cavity actually communicates with the pleural cavity so that whatever the fluid that will trickle into the pleural cavity and because of the large surface area of the pleural cavity the fluid gets absorbed so the another advantage of this procedure is that we send this pericardial tissue and we can send it to the, all the microbiology investigations and uh, based on the report we have uh, we can actually uh, start the att or modify the att depending on the sensitivity report in fact, we are writing a, our experience uh, regarding this uh, VATS pericardial window, thoracoscopic pericardial window in pericardial effusions, and most probably in few days. It has been uploaded and we are awaiting the approval. Great, Dr. Monar, uh, great inputs. So, I have just been told that uh, we have 983 logins for this uh, webinar. So, I must say that this is, of, of course, a very uh, popular topic. And uh, do we have, I think uh, it's 9.45, we're way beyond our time. Yes, Samir? Uh, I would want uh, Nagarjuna to give just a comprehensive view on uh, instrumentation required for uh, pulmonary TB diagnosis. Where, where does a bronchoscope come into picture, whereas uh, EBUS, cryobiopsy, medical thoracoscopy? Because a lot of uh, budding doctors are basically looking for what machines to buy what would basically suffice uh, in diagnosis of pulmonary TB? I think for somebody who is beginning, the three things which are required are a conventional bronchoscope. So whichever they want to have a therapeutic bronchoscope. So it's uh, depending upon their uh, uh, ability and availability, they can have one therapeutic adult bronchoscope, the first thing. The second thing, which is cost effective for a pulmonologist is a thoracoscope. Again, uh, I would uh, prefer a rigid thoracoscope over a flexible rigid thoracoscope because of the ease of adhesiolysis with the rigid thoracoscope. The third thing which they could add on to this thing is a linear EBUS. I think this is the way in which uh, they should procure the equipments also. So the linear EBUS is the thing because this is also the, the way of uh, the, uh, the number of procedures you do. The highest number would be conventional bronchoscope, then thoracoscope, then linear EBUS. So once you have all these three, the ad adult bronchoscope, therapeutic, a uh, thoracoscope, preferably rigid, but flex rigid also is okay, and a linear reverse, you would be able to diagnose 95% of cases of tuberculosis. Then comes the role of radial ebus, cryo, and all those things, because all of them would only add up to only 5% of the cases which you would miss with these three tools. I think this is all I have to say, Samit, for those who are beginning. These so are the so rigid bronchoscopy can be useful for the therapeutic procedures. No, but when we talk important. about, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think I want to add to that. I think it's all as far as rigid versus flexi-rigid thoracoscopy. I think it depends a lot on your training also and what you're comfortable with. I think that is what is basically leading your choice of instrumentation. But yes, linear EBUS, I think, is... I mean, going to be something that you cannot have a bronchoscopy suite without having a linear EBUS going forward, and you're going to be able to diagnose much more with that. Uh, any other uh, closing remarks for you, Samir? Anything that you would like? That, that was my closing remark, the question that itself. That was your was question was a closing remark. Uh, yes, Dr. Mohan? So, nothing, madam. Just uh, there are definitive... Uh... Uh, surgical indications uh, in uh, tracheobronchial tuberculosis, in pleural tuberculosis, so and the bronchopleural fistulas. So, if the, the patient falls into this criteria, he should be definitely offered a surgical intervention so that the patient can get the best. Great. So, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have Dr. Mohan, Dr. Nagarjuna, and Dr. Samir on this panel. We've had some great questions uh, uh, and some great answers and uh, some interesting questions from the audience as well. So to summarize the entire thing, we decided that we should have this session because conventionally tuberculosis, when we talk about tuberculosis, we only talk about 
pills and we only talk about uh, tablets and we talk about we don't really talk much about what can be done for diagnostic and therapeutic interventions and there is a large spectrum of patients who will benefit with these procedures as uh, diagnostic procedures are definitely on the rise more people are doing ebus and more people are doing uh, thoracoscopy when indicated for diagnosis of mediastinal lymph node tuberculosis and pleural tuberculosis however as nagarjuna has pointed out and as what i wanted to project with my talk is that unfortunately sometimes bronchial stenosis or tracheobronchial stenosis is something that we very largely miss because we forget to pick it up when we are looking at scans or forget to really focus on it because we are so focused on treating the tuberculosis itself so we must remember that tuberculosis has sequelae which are not only some fibro uh, you know bronchiectatic sequelae they may have much larger sequelae like for example you could have pericardial thickening as dr mohan said which requires intervention you could have tracheal or bronco stenosis which will require intervention only so please 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 do not miss this things do pick them up and uh, we are always there all of us to help you with uh, whatever diagnostic dilemmas you have and thoughts to discuss please if you have any questions that you would like even going forward i'm sure you could reach out to any of us and uh, you know we would be able to help you with this again i must thank cci for having us here for uh, actually uh, agreeing to have this uh, discussion which is somewhat offbeat and uh, i'm very glad that we had a lovely audience we had a large participation and i must thank you all uh, uh, thank you nagarjuna thank you mohan and thank you samir for your great inputs and your presence throughout this session and taking out this time uh, with thank this you. i wind up thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.